Let's open our, in our Bibles, please, to Romans chapter 8, and you'll be pleased to know that we are moving on to verses 28 through 30. It took us three lessons, I think, to get through 26 and 27. But I felt like those uh, passages, or those verses in particular, are sometimes difficult for people to understand. So hopefully that helped you. And if anything, I think, uh, as I said before, I think it will help you in perhaps a time to come when you're going through uh, immense struggles and trials. But anyway, Romans chapter 8, uh, my goal is to get through verses 28 and 29 today, and then we'll pick up uh, verse 30 um, in greater detail next time. I'll begin reading now. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. For whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom He predestined, these He also called. Whom he called, these he also justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. So he begins uh, verse 28 with the words, and we know. Uh, and this is in contrast to verse 26, because remember in verse 26, he talked about something we don't know. And what we didn't know in verse 26 is we didn't know what we should pray for as we ought. And in particular, the thing we didn't know what to pray for as we ought is we didn't know God's will as it pertains to the particulars of our life in our present state of suffering and weaknesses. And you remember weaknesses is defined, uh, we defined it for you, the way it's used in Scripture is uh, our fallen human condition of sin, uh, sickness or infirmities, and then lastly, any type of adversity that you or I experience in life are our weaknesses. And it's in those weaknesses that the Spirit helps us and He helps us to, in, He intercedes for us um, concerning these events that we don't know what to pray for. And how many of you would be honest, right? I mean, there's opposition, things that happen in your life and you just... You just don't know what to pray for because the suffering is so great and the weaknesses are so real that you really don't even know what to pray for. And that's where the Spirit kicks in and helps us in, those states, in that state of weakness. But now he's going to talk to us about something we know. And I think everybody in here and probably every Christian everywhere loves verse 28. It's probably one of the most popular, maybe one of the most... Um, cited, quoted, memorized verses in all the Bible. Um, and my goal today is to help you to understand what verse 28 is saying and the beauty and the glory of it. And uh, I'll be honest with you, it will, uh, to some extent, kind of bust your bubble as to what you think verse 28 is saying. So I'm going to ask uh, two questions and give you two answers, and that's going to be the message for today. The first question is simply this, and we have kind of an answered this already, and we know that all things work together for good. The, the first question is this, what are the all things that he's talking about? Again, you have to keep everything in context, and in context, if you've been with us the last two months, I, I'm not sure how long we've been on this, you've been with us the last couple of months, the all things is the sufferings of this present time, all the way back in verse 18. It's the futility. It's that frustration that we have with our current condition because the entire world is in a fallen condition and every person is in a fallen condition. So there's great frustration or futility there. Uh, it's the groanings. It's the bondage of corruption. It's the weaknesses that we have uh, inherently within us. 
and it's these weaknesses and this suffering and, and these are the all things that are being worked together for good, right? It's not good things. You don't need good things to work together for good. The good things are already good. Uh, what you need to work together for good is all the bad stuff, all the junk that this world throws at us, all the junk that we see within ourselves or within others around us. It's, it's all the sufferings of this present time and all the human weaknesses that we have that have been made real to us. And, and that's the all things that he's working on, okay? So it's all the bad things. And then we ask the question here uh, today, um, what is the good? What, what is the good that, that God is working out in the midst of all of these things? What is the good? And uh, to answer that, I want to say, first of all, what it is not. And this is where I said it might burst your bubble just a little bit uh, as to what, he's, what he means by the good. The good is not the absence of present suffering. That's not the good. So if you, if you thought the good is the absence of present suffering, if you think it's the absence of weakness... If you think it's the absence of the groaning and the futility and the frustration and the bondage to corruption, if you, if you think it's the absence of that, that's not the good. And that's where I said that, that kind of bursts our thinking because I think that's how most people read this text is that, yeah, all these things are bad that are happening, but God's going to take them and he's going to take them and he's going to remove me from, the, from those things and now I'm going to be in the absence of this suffering and now it's going to be good. I want you to rest your eyes upon three verses real quickly that are in Romans chapter 8. I want you to skip down to verses 35 through 37. And then we're going to back up to a previous verse um, before this. We're going to read verses 35 through 37. Again, the, the verse 35 and 36 are going to describe some of these all things that he's working together for good. But I want you to notice what it says. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Notice verse 37. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Notice that it's not in the absence of these things that we're more than conquerors. It's in these things that we are more than conquerors, right? It's in the midst of the tribulation, the distress, the persecution, the famine, the nakedness, the peril, and the sword. It's, it's in the midst of the being killed all day long and sheep being made ready for the slaughter. It's in the midst of that that we are more than conquerors through Him that loved us. It's in the midst of the present sufferings of this age that we are more than conquerors through Him that loved us. I remember uh, years ago I was preaching on this text to a very, very poor and destitute, persecuted group of believers. It was just a small gathering of Christians. And I was telling them from this text, I said, did you know that right now in the midst of all of your affliction, I mean, I'm talking about real poverty, right? I'm talking about hand-to-mouth poverty. You know, most of us have a freezer or multiple freezers full of food. I'm talking about people that uh, probably the only food they have in their home is a bag of rice. And then to dress up that rice, they'll have, you know, five cups of rice with their meal. And then they'll try to get a little gravy or a little broth. Uh, maybe they'll catch a little fish and have a little bit of fish on the side. And that's their meal. And they live day to day in that condition. Real poverty, one change of clothes, one pair of shoes, you know, just barely getting by, just barely surviving. And I told them, I said, you guys right now in your present condition, you are more than conquerors through Christ who loves you. Right? It's, it's an American gospel to think that 
we're only more than conquerors if you know if our bank account is full we're in good health our bank account is full our, we're in good health all the bills are paid all my all my life is going well there's no circumstances no challenges no suffering no trials no, no anything everything is good everything's going great then we're more than conquerors that's kind of the American view of this and let me just say this in case you ever find yourself in a circumstance where you're preaching the gospel to, to other people, is to realize this, that if, 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 if this, if what we preach cannot be preached in another nation to other people, it is not God's word. It's not the gospel. Because most people are going to have no understanding or comprehension of, did you save enough money for retirement? Most people in the world have no comprehension of that at all. Because they're living hand to mouth. They're living day to day. They, they, they can't understand that. And so if our message is coming in and, you know, good, uh, excuse me, being more than conquer is having an absence of problems and an absence of difficulties, they won't find any relatability to that. And the Bible doesn't teach that. It's in the midst of these things that you're more than conquerors. So if you're suffering today, you're more than a conqueror. Not because you're suffering, but because Christ is with you. Nothing is separating from you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Amen? Also, verse 17. So we, we, we went forward. Now we're going to back up into reverse. And look at verse 17. He says, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and join heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him, that we may also be glorified together. Right? We're just proving the fact that what he means by good is not the absence of suffering. Because he says, number one, you're a co-heir. But being a co-heir means this. It means you're going to co-suffer with him. Because that, right? You're, you're inheriting everything that belongs to him. Jesus suffered. So you're going to co-suffer. You're going to suffer with him. And then a part of you being an heir or a co-heir with him is that one day you're going to be co-glorified with him, just like him. That's... That's co-suffering, then co-glorified. And so suffering is a part of our Christian existence. In fact, I would say that it is necessary. It is inescapable. So if we begin to look at the good in verse 28 as an escape from all the bad, all the suffering, I would say that you're being misled. So what is the good? Right? That's, that's a good question. What is the good? He says, for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his what? Purpose. And then what he does in verse 29 and 30, you'll notice in verse 29, what's the first word in verse 29? For or because, right? I mean, for is just another word for because. So in other words, verse 28 is true. All things working together for good because of what he says in verse 29 and 30. So verse 29 and 30 is the foundation that verse 28 rests upon. So if you understand verse 29 and 30, verse 29 and 30 is the good of verse 28. And verse 29 and 30 has to do with, again, those who are, who are called according to his purpose. And that's what verse 29 and 30 are about. Verse 29 and 30 are about the eternal purpose and plan of God that began before the foundation of the world in eternity past and stretches all the way to a future time in eternity when we are glorified together with Him. And that is what is in view in verses 29 through 30 is this eternal plan of God, this eternal purpose of God that is being worked out and that's the good. The good today, my friends, is the fact that you are included in God's eternal plan. From before the foundation of the world, stretching all the way into eternity future, and you're a part of that plan. It would be a miserable life if you were not a part of that plan. The reason why this is important, right? We're part of an eternal plan, an eternal purpose of God. 
The reason this is important is, let me say it this way. How many of us, in, in our, uh, especially in our culture, we, we often say, and we, maybe, maybe everybody in here has said it before, life is short. How many have ever heard that before? We have said that before, right? Life is short. And then it's usually followed up with, life is short, so just do whatever makes you happy. I say this, I say life is long. Life is long. From the moment that you were conceived in your mother's womb, you will never cease to exist. Never. From the moment of your conception, you will always be. <laughs> Let that sink in if it can, right? Life is long. And what we should be thinking, how we should view our lives on earth is, is what can I do that is the will of God and the call of God for my life so that in that future state of glory, I will be well rewarded for what I have done in this life, in this present time of suffering. How have I served the Lord? How have I lived for Him? What have I done for Him that He's going to reward me for in eternity that I will enjoy the compensation of it, if you will, in the eternal state? Rather than thinking, well, I'm just going to live my life for me and whatever pleases me, whatever makes me happy, that's what I'm going to do because life is short. I think you're misunderstanding life. Life is long. It's an, you're, you're part, right now, all of you in here, you're part of an eternal plan. The plan never runs out. There's an eternal future here that is in view. And so your life is not just this, you know, however many years you live in existence in the body that you're in right now. It's, it's, it's forever. And that's what we should be thinking of, living in the light of eternity. And then in verse 29 and 30, so let's talk about that for or because. And he's going to talk about five different things. Um, verses 29 and 30 uh, has, for many years now, been called uh, the golden chain of redemption. Uh, the reason it's called the golden chain is that uh, it's, it's a chain of five links or five truths that are defined in five words, and they say it's a link because each one is connected to the other. These are not um, isolated, separate truths. These are all interconnected truths that all uh, connect with one another. And uh, by understanding the first one in this link, uh, which is going to be foreknowledge, uh, you, it helps you to understand the rest that are in this chain. Of redemption, and again, it's five links to this chain, uh, and it's defined by five words. Those five words are for new in verse twenty-nine, predestined, which is in verse twenty-nine and verse thirty. Uh, it, the uh, called, which is in verse twenty-eight and verse thirty, justified, which is in verse thirty, and glorified, which is also in verse thirty. So you have for new predestined, called, justified, glorified. These are the five chains, or if you will, excuse me, five links, I'm sorry, five links of the chain of redemption. Uh, think of it this way, five truths. I think that's probably easier to just accept it that way. Five truths in this chain of redemption. Now, the, the crux of, the, of understanding this is the very beginning, which is the word for new. I think if you, if you misunderstand for new, you're going to misunderstand the rest. Because the, the four feed off of the one, the one that came first, the, the one that came first in the series of five, that one, all the rest are built upon that one. So if you get the first one wrong, it's likely that you're going to get the second, the third, the fourth, and the fifth wrong if you get the first one wrong. So we're going to spend the rest of our time, because I'm looking at the clock and we have communion and so on and so forth, but I'm just going to focus on that for new uh, for the remainder of our time. In doing this, uh, first of all, let's just look at the word, right, uh, in its most basic sense. 
The meaning of the word foreknew, obviously it's two words. It just means to know beforehand. For, beforehand, and knew or know. To know something beforehand. The one who is knowing something beforehand is God. It says he foreknew, referring to God. God foreknew. So the one for knowing is God, and what he is for knowing is a certain group of people. It says, whom he foreknew. So it's God knowing something in advance, beforehand, before the world was. What he knows is a certain group of people defined as whom. Uh, he's not seeing uh, events or circumstances or foreseeing faith. He is seeing a people. He's foreknowing a people. And the, the people that he's foreknowing are these same people that he's going to predestine, he's going to call, he's going to justify, he's going to glorify. It's all the same people. So what are we to think of the word foreknew or foreknowledge is this. Uh, there's, there's two... Two primary views of, of this word for new and its meaning. Uh, and I'm going to give you what is probably the most popular view first and then refute it. The word for new by many is seen as just, just simply God looking down through the ages of time, through the corridors of time, and seeing how individuals would respond to the gospel. And so he looks down and he sees Kayla and Nick and he sees that they're going to say yes to Jesus. They're going to believe in him. And so based on him seeing that they're going to say yes, God says yes to them and he chooses them. In other words, it's the idea that God chooses you because you chose him. And so because God foreknew that you would choose him, then God chose you. Or the, advert, the opposite of that, right? The, uh, uh, God sees that you're going to reject him, so he rejects you. He doesn't choose you. Right? It makes, it makes uh, people the causation of salvation. Because God is basing his election, his choice of salvation upon the human response. So it's now uh, election is because of my faith rather than my faith is because of election. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? So it, it puts the, the, the onus on people. And the reason why that's popular is because, especially as Americans, is it appeals to our sense of fairness. It seems fair that, well, of course, God chooses those who choose Him. Or, of course, God rejects those who reject Him. That just seems fair. We, we, we said no, and so He said no. We said yes, so, so He said yes. Right? But, but you'll notice it puts, it puts us in the, the driver's seat, in command. It puts us as the causation of it. We don't think it's fair. In fact, it runs shivers down our spines, usually, to say that we chose God because He chose us. Or, we didn't choose God because He didn't choose us. Right? That, that just sends shivers down people's spine because now you're saying God is the causation and not man. That now God as the Creator is truly free and the creature is not. <laughs> So that's, that's, the, that's the, probably the most common view uh, in the church world today is that view. Um, I'm going to refute that three ways. Um, first is I want you to notice that it says over and over again in verse 29 and 30, He, being God, He foreknew, He also predestined. Then you get into verse 30. He predestined, and then he talks about he called, and he justified, he glorified. The emphasis in verse 29 and 30 is upon what God has done. Not upon what people are doing or what people have done. There's no command in here for you to do anything. There's not even a command of faith or belief or repentance. 
It is all the action of God. God is the subject. There's a five different verbs, as, we, as we've talked about. Foreknew, predestined, called, justified, glorified. Subject, verb, object. The subject is acting upon the object. The object is, again, this is the second argument, it is whom he foreknew. He also predestined. And then he goes on in verse 30. Whom he predestined. Then whom he called. And whom he justi justified. These he also glorified. Right? It's these people that he is justifying. He's glorifying. It's, it's, it's God acting upon people. And, and that is what is in view here. It is a people that he foreknew. Not a thing, not an object, not a circumstance, not an event, not a conversion, not a person's faith or lack of faith. But what, he see, what, what is being foreknown is people. What's being predestined is people. What, what, it, what is being uh, uh, called is people. What is being justified is people. What is being glorified is people. And it's a certain group of people and that certain group of people are the people that he foreknew. So what I want to do with the remainder of our time as we, as we bring this to a conclusion for today is I want us to look at that examples in the Bible where it says that God knew somebody versus God not knowing somebody and see how it's used and then bring it back here to verse number 29 and then you're just putting the word for in front of it that, that God knew people this way beforehand before the world ever was in, in eternity past and so that's what we're going to do and then uh, we'll close back here in just a moment and uh, we'll pick up probably with predestination next week so I'm going to begin you're welcome to follow me if you want um, I'm going to go to Amos chapter 3, and then the rest of them are all going to be in the New Testament. Amos chapter 3, we're going to see how God uses the word no. And we're going to go to a handful of passages in the New Testament and put this all together. In Amos chapter 3, verses 1 and 2... It says, Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O children of Israel, against the whole family which I brought up from the land of Egypt, saying, this is what God says to Israel, You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore I will punish you for all your iniquities. Well, when he says, You only have I known, does, does it mean that God is totally unaware of all the other nations and all the other families of the earth? Absolutely not, right? Obviously, God knows everyone and every family and every nation. Um, it is not that God is unaware of these other nations. But what he is saying is simply this. Uh, I think it's the NASB that, that uses the word chosen in the place of the word known. You only have I chosen. And, and that's what the word carries the idea of, is it carries the idea of choosing. Right? Out of all the peoples of the earth, God chooses a single man named Abram, changes his name to Abraham. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Jacob, Israel, chooses a people. This people is Israel. They become his covenant people. They become the means by which he institutes the covenants uh, in, into the earth. And this becomes the people that he knows. These are his covenant people. He knows them. He chose them. He raised them up. He brought them out of Egypt, right? This is his people. And his people that he's using to, uh, to bring uh, his word to the nations. So that's, that's how he's using the word. So I'm going to go now just uh, through a couple in the Gospels, a couple in the, in the letters. Matthew chapter 7. Matthew 7 is, is phenomenal. This is actually one of my favorite passages to preach on because it's the culmination of the, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, which we all know and love, Matthew 5 through 7, is this Sermon on the Mount. And, you know, he's just talked about two gates, two ways, two groups of people, two expected outcomes, two types of tree, trees, good trees bearing good fruit, bad trees bearing bad fruit. Now he's going to talk about two different professions, two different confessions. 
uh, confessions of a person and then the confession of Christ. And then he's going to close by talking about two different types of hearers. One group of hearers build their house on sand. Another group of hearers build their house on a rock. So two different types of builders, if you will. Verses 21 through 23, these are the two different confessions, the two different professions. Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, so that's their confession. These people are saying, Lord, Lord shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, so now this is the Lord's confession, I never what? I never knew you. What does he mean? I don't even know who you are, <laughs> uh, as though he has no cognition of who these people are. Or does he mean, I don't know you savingly. I don't know you. I didn't, I didn't set my love upon you. I didn't bring salvation to you. You're claiming to know me, but I, I don't know who you are. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So these people that were false professors... False prof that's a very real thing. These are false professors that claim to know Christ. They cling to their good works. Look at what we did. We prophesied in your name. We did wonders in your name. We cast out demons in your name. Look at, look at, look at, look at what I did. He says, no, I don't even know who you are. They were false professors and Jesus says, I never knew you. I don't, I don't know who you are. Now, now contrast that with John 10. He's going to talk about people he does know. John chapter 10, verse 14. Jesus says these words, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and am known by my own. Now notice here, he doesn't know everybody this way. He only knows what? His sheep. He only knows his sheep. And his sheep are defined a little bit later in this passage, in verse 26 and 27. But you do not believe because you're not my sheep. Who, who are the people that are not his sheep? The people that don't believe. As I said to you, my sheep, this is how you know you're one of his sheep. My sheep hear my voice. We'll talk about that another time. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. So an indication of a genuine believer in Christ is that they hear the voice of the shepherd, and they respond favorably to the voice of the shepherd by following him. They hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. So God has, the Lord has this intimate knowledge of who his sheep are. If you're not his sheep, he doesn't know you. If you're his sheep, he knows you. And again, this is knowing in a saving manner, a loving manner, a salvific manner. That is how he's knowing you. Further proof, okay, in case you're not convinced yet. Maybe, maybe Jesus' words aren't good enough, not clear enough. So let, let's do a couple more real quickly. Um, 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy. Actually, while I'm going to 2 Timothy, I'm going to stop off in Galatians. Galatians 4, verse 9. But now, after you have known God, or rather, are known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage? Notice that... Not only did they know God, but they were what? Known by God. Let me just put it to you this way. If you're not known by God, you can't know God. God knows you first, and because He knows you, then you know Him. Um, another way to say this, uh, I wasn't planning this one, but I'm going to use it anyway. I love this verse. 1 Corinthians 8, verse 3. You don't have to turn there, because I'm going to just be there a split second. But if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. Right? God knows you, and because he knows you, the response is that you love him. 
He, he set His affection upon you. He set His knowledge upon you. He set His love upon you. He foreknew you. And now because of that knowledge of you, now you have turned around in response and loved Him, the knowing preceding the loving. And now 2 Timothy, okay? 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 19. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands having this seal. What's the seal? The Lord knows those who are His. Question, who does the Lord know? Those who are His. Very specific, right? Not everybody, but a specific. The Lord knows those who are His. Not everybody He knows His sheep. People come to him in that day, Lord, Lord, he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. I didn't know you savingly. He says to Israel, you only have I known. I, you, only I, Of all the nations, you're the only one I chose. I didn't choose 20 nations or 30 nations or 40 nations. I chose you. You're the only nation I chose. That's how he's using the word no. That's how the word know is used here. Um, it's, it's used in the context of this intimate knowledge, of this saving knowledge of. So now we add the word for to it. Romans 8, 29. And so all, all you're doing is this, is you're saying there is a group of people for because whom. So there's this people whom. He foreknew. God foreknew. So He set His knowledge, His saving knowledge, His saving love upon a group of people. And it's that group of people that He then predestines, that He then calls, that He then justifies, that He then ultimately glorifies, brings you into the eternal state and kingdom. So that's the meaning of foreknowledge. That's the meaning of the Lord knows those who are His. He knows them in a saving manner. This is the plan that you're a part of. And that's why if, if the earth is in a state of chaos or your life is in a state of chaos or no matter what is happening in your, in, in, in your, in your life or in the world today, we can say that in all these things we are more than conquerors. Why? Because I'm a part of this eternal plan that God, in His mind, created before the world ever was. And He, at that time, chose me and put my name in the book of life before the foundation of the world. So that my salvation, which was yet future, was secured from eternity past. So I ask you, my friends, don't get, don't get captivated by the trappings of this world and realize that the good is this eternal plan of God and the fact that you have been included in this eternal plan of God. And that's why he can say, right, verse 28, last thing, last thing I'm saying, verse 28 is a promise not for everybody, right? There's two qualifiers. And we know that all things work together for good to what? To those who love God and to those who are the called according to His purpose. What purpose? This eternal purpose in verses 29 and 30. Those people, everything works together for good. Because you're a part of that purpose. You're a part of that plan. You've been called into that. We'll talk about th that word calling next week. You're called into that plan. That's the good, my friend. And it is good. So let's close there. Um, let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Because that's what grace is all about. We didn't do anything. We weren't here. We didn't do any work. Uh, we were not conceived. We, we didn't even exist. The, the earth was not even here. And yet you foreknew us. You chose to know us savingly before the world ever was. And through that, 
You brought about a predestined will for our life, a predetermined will for our life that we would know you. And you called us to that, and which led to justification and then ultimately glorification. Lord, we're grateful to be a part of this plan. We're grateful to not be excluded from this plan. It is truly a work of grace. And for this, we are exceedingly thankful and grateful with all of our hearts. And it's with this that we partake of the Lord's Supper, remembering that Christ died for our sins, that He rose for our justification, which is all part of this great eternal plan for those whom you foreknew. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.